RIT is considered to be one of the most accessible college campuses in the world. Today on Intersections, the RIT podcast, NTID President Jerry Buckley and RIT Director of Disability Services Catherine Lewis chat about how that accessibility came to be, including the signing of the landmark 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. Jerry and Catherine provide their perspectives on the history of accessibility in higher education, how far we've come, and how far we have yet to go. The ADA recently had its 30th anniversary at the end of July. And from our conversations, I know you were around and involved when that act uh, was initially passed. Can you talk about what that was like being there for that and what it meant to you? Sure, sure. Um, it really was an exciting time. I had the honor of being a guest of Senator Robert Dole, who was one of the co-sponsors of the bill. And, uh, you know, just several thousand individuals with disabilities, their parents, their advocates, business community, all coming together to celebrate the passage of a civil rights act for individuals with disabilities. It was really a historic moment, a very proud moment. And it was the result of several years of strong lobbying and advocating for the importance of that civil rights legislation. And when we were at the White House that day, it was that sense of, ha, we did it. Now the hard work of implementing the law begins. And now 30 years later, we look back and we can see the successes, but we can also see as you and I have discussed, Catherine, the work that needs to be done and that's part of the discussion today. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I guess as we think big picture about this, um, both in terms of your own personal life and in terms of systems, what do you think has changed since that time 30 years ago when the ADA was first passed? I think fundamentally now there's a commitment in both the public and the private sector to access for individuals with disabilities. It's legally mandated now. So discrimination on the basis of disability in the private sector is outlawed. And that's open doors in employment, in transportation, in all areas of life that allows individuals with disabilities to participate in the mainstream of society. So I, I sense that what we had 30 plus years ago was kind of a voluntary spirit by the private sector if they wanted to provide accommodations with individuals with disabilities after 30. Now for the last 30 years, it's been mandated by law. So we're beginning to see an increasing number of individuals with disabilities who've taken advantage of that law and are rising up in American life, in the American community, and participating in the mainstream of life in a very positive and constructive way. Yeah, it's a, a powerful thing. And, you know, as I, I heard you talking about how when the law was passed, we thought about how much work was yet to be done. One of the things I try to keep at the front of my mind is that the law is the floor, not the ceiling. Um, and so I think even though um, I was just in what preschool or so when, when the law was first passed. It's been interesting for me to reflect on how things have changed um, from when I was in public school and when I first started college to now working in higher education. And I don't know if you feel the same way, Jerry, but it, it seems to me like we've got to strike this balance between celebrating how far we have come and, and thinking pretty hard about where we have yet to go. And, I'm curious what you think just in terms of, of where we do have yet to go. You know, what, what did you expect might already be happening 30 years later that's not yet? Uh, 30 years later, especially in the area of employment, I expected to see more, more gains. I expected to see the employment rate, the unemployment rate of individuals with disabilities significantly lower. I expected to see disabled individuals who had access to higher education now with accommodations. I expected them to be progressing and that's happening. We see more individuals with disabilities graduating with their MDs, their PhDs, their law degrees, their engineering degrees. 
And we slowly see business and industry really trying to create opportunities to take advantage of these individual skills. But if you look at the overall data, you see that in the area of employment, we still have, for example, in the deaf and hard of hearing community, 50% of our citizens with hearing loss who are deaf and hard of hearing not working and capable of working and contributing to the American economy. And so that's where I see work needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Those numbers are, are pretty, pretty solemn, you know, when we think about what could be versus what is in terms of the employment rates of folks. And, um, you know, as somebody who both lives disability herself and, and supports students along their path to, to reaching employment and living fulfilled whole lives, it's, it's tough to, to meet students and see all their potential and work with them to put the supports in place so that they can equitably engage and then see that that support doesn't always carry forward into the workforce. And so, um, you know, what do you think is missing there? What's the disconnect, especially when, when folks enter into employment? I, I think the disconnect and it's changing with, you know, the national movement towards the disability equity index and the private sector now beginning to establish expectations for itself. Uh, but I think that last sector of convincing the business community that individuals with disabilities have much to offer from an economic perspective and not seeing them just as a cost, but as part of the diversity picture that the company wants to embrace in the inclusive environment that the company wants to promote. And we have to continue to stay very, very, very focused on that and helping companies to see that accommodations are part of the cost of doing business. They're not extra special. They're, they're not a burden. They really are part of the enhancing the diversity in the inclusive, in the inclusive approach. I do see some progress. It's just lower than I would like. And I think also we need to be knowledgeable that individuals of color who are disabled have also brought it to our attention that they haven't enjoyed the same gains and privileges that white individuals with disabilities have experienced. And so therefore we have work to do in the area of racial justice and social justice to make sure that individuals who are disabled, who are people of color, who are BIPOC, have the same opportunities as individuals who are not. And I think we have work to do in that area that racial discrimination, in addition to disability discrimination, really is still a fact of life in many situations. And we need to address it uh, through the enforcement mechanisms that are in place, or if those things have been ignored or neglected, we need to advocate for the more strict enforcement of the regulations and the laws and hold companies accountable for fulfilling their commitment to diversity and inclusion. I, I couldn't agree more with you, Jerry. I think one of the most important things that we can do is, is take an intersectional look at who folks are. And none of us live single issue lives. None of us are, are single, single issue people. And somebody who identifies within the disability community, you know, that's, that's one facet of who they are and all of our facets intersect, you know? So, thinking about layers of inequity, um, people of color, LGBTQ people, first generation folks navigating new systems. There are so many ways I think we need to pay attention, right? To, to different needs, different contexts. Um, that's powerful stuff, it's powerful. And I think RIT and NTID as an employer can play a role in being a model to the Rochester community, to the regional community, to the nation in the world in our own employment practices and goals and so forth. So RIT has a commitment to the inclusion of individuals with disabilities. We have goals and targets that we honor and we work towards. I also think NTID through its national outreach role through our center on employment has a special responsibility to help employers and the work and the American workplace make the adjustments that are necessary. It's really fascinating when you really ask why businesses don't serve or employ individuals with disabilities. It's often based on a myth or a misunderstanding about cost. 
that it's not as expensive as they perceive it to be and the benefits far outweigh the, the cost. But I think we have more of a job to do to be informing employers and in particular, uh, the realities of what the costs are and how they can meet those responsibilities as employers. You know, I, I think you're so right that, that attitudes are a really key ingredient here. And it makes me think about how we define disability and, and what I, I perceive to be some misconceptions in terms of what disability really means. And, you know, for me, as, as somebody who identifies personally as a disabled woman and who's spent her whole life so far, you know, digging into disability and what it means for folks, I think we need to really disassociate this, this identity with deficit to, to really think about disability as um, Robin Germa, a disability rights lawyer says, she's, she calls disability an opportunity for innovation. You know, and really what, what could be more RIT? You know, disability as an opportunity to, to be creative, to do innovative things, to try different routes, different processes, not, you know, in, in spite of, of who we are, but, but really leaning into who we are as disabled people and what that means for what we can contribute. And, you know, for me, I, I've thought a lot about how to define disability, you know, such a massive term that can encompass so many things, so many people. And from where I sit, the only sort of philosophical definition that, that's felt right to me is this idea of necessary creativity. I think when you, when you live in a body or a mind or a way of being in the world that's atypical, you inherently learn to embrace alternative possibilities. And, and so I think as you speak about employer perspectives, not only thinking about what is right in terms of equitable hiring practices and sort of the, the letter of the law, but thinking from this really sort of empowered, excited framework of what can somebody bring to the workforce? Certainly, absolutely, because of who they are. You know, and I wonder how that feels for you. Do, do you find, you know, disability or deaf identity to be a really core part of who and how you function in the world? Sure, yeah. Um, we, you know, we're very fortunate at NTID that we have a critical mass of 1,200 deaf and hard of hearing students, plus several hundred deaf and hard of hearing faculty. And all of them have the opportunity to kind of find their identity, find out where they fit in the world as well as a, a deaf person and as a deaf professional and see role models, the importance of that, the importance of our young deaf students seeing deaf people who completed law degrees, medical degrees, because like it or not, individuals with disabilities still often hear negative messages about what they're capable of or not capable of. And so the power of role models on our campus, you're meeting someone who has who's deaf, PhD or MD or whatever, and hearing the positive messages, yes, you can, yes, you can. And feeling comfortable in your own skin as a deaf person and being able to say, hey, I'm comfortable calling myself deaf. I embrace sign language. I embrace the culture that's involved in it. I embrace the community that's involved in it. It doesn't limit me, it opens doors for me. And, you know, it's fascinating how many companies right now are very enthusiastic when they begin to understand deafness from a cultural perspective. They begin to say, oh yeah, just like we have other cultures in our workforce, we need to be inclusive of deaf people who come from that culture, that experience, use sign language and have their own norms and so forth. And so the RIT campus kind of reflects that when you walk around the campus and you see the signing, you see the commitment to access, you see people who are sensitive on an ongoing basis, you see the respect for ASL on our campus. You know, it's, it's really a model of what I wish all campuses and all communities have. We're not there yet. Someday we'll get there, but Rochester is a very special community and RIT is a very special place because NTID has been home there for 50 years. Yeah, you know, it reminds me, the other day I was on campus and I, I took a break um, over the lunch hour just to, to scoot around campus and, and see some folks. I think, especially in the middle of the pandemic, I'm, I'm so hungry for just incidental interpersonal interactions. And so I, I just took a scoot around in my, in my scooter and 
it was the first time as a professional. I'm, I'm 34 years old. I've been working, you know, for coming up on a decade. And it was the first time I saw a number of other folks who use mobility devices, who navigated in ways that were similar to me. Um, and it was just this feeling of, wow, you know, what, what a place where I can find community to see myself represented. You know, even, even though I'm in a, a leadership position here, I, I'm still hungry for that sense of precedent, community, critical mass, as you put it. And I think that really is one of the things that's so special about being here at IIT. And also one of the areas where I think we can, can continue to grow. You know, I, when I worked in college admissions, it was a really interesting thing thinking about how we do a lot of work to reach out to all different kinds of underrepresented folks. And sometimes I think folks are, are fearful of doing that same kind of outreach to draw in folks with disabilities to campuses. Um, and what would happen? What could we do if we really wove disability into diversity more broadly, both in, in programming, cultural programming, admissions practices, right? To say, you belong here. And we are so excited to have you here because of what you bring to this community. So yeah, RIT really is a special place. I agree. And we, we are fortunate to work there. And in this COVID-19 environment, it's also something we live with daily. Uh, and it is, it is very unique. Uh, we've had to think multiple times about how we're gonna deal with communication issues, face masks, uh, ASR recognition devices, and on and on and on. How do we make sure, even in this environment, which is, which is unique and strange and kind of eerie, how do we really provide equal access? And I've really, I've, I've been very proud of the community overall. I haven't had to, in my role, I often have to say, don't forget about this. But many times now people are already ahead of the game and saying, hey, we have 1200 deaf students. What are we gonna do when they show up into the food service and everybody's masked and they can't communicate effectively? Or what are we gonna do when a person is, um, when the interpreter is, or the captionist is wearing a face mask plus a shield and all of a sudden the acoustic ability is significantly re reduced, what are we gonna do to, and what we found is many of the solutions are benefiting all students, yeah. all students. And if we can continue to advocate for universal de design on the campus, I use that one example, you know, the partnership we have with IBM for uh, for their translator. When we used that in classes where we thought deaf students were gonna sign up and then deaf students didn't, and then we tried to withdraw that automatic speech recognition captioning, the students objected because everyone wanted access to that. They felt it would benefit them. So I think those are just an example of where IT can continue to be a leader in advocating access for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, and you're right that the, the pandemic has, has brought to light, highlighted different accessibility needs that folks have in some pretty powerful ways. You know, and I think not only about the really uh, critical considerations in terms of communication access that you alluded to, but um, folks with chronic illness, folks who are at higher risk during the pandemic, that is a disability issue. What is sure. your safe access on this campus? Sure. And, folks who are navigating mental health as, as a part of their life um, might be really strongly impacted by what's going on in the world today, you know, to a, to a degree that, that impacts their ability to engage comfortably in the world. And so accommodation coordination is, is different now than I think it has been before. And it's, it's tough, right? Because think about a, a, a person, for example, who has chronic migraines for whom all of this screen time that we're engaging in can cause a really tough issue. You know, for, sure. for folks who, um, for example, receive information in, in unique ways, if, if you're getting all your content in a really visual medium, you know, how do you find a way around that? Um, and even as we were thinking about how to keep campus safe, uh, thinking about the sanitizing of door handles in the same breath as we think about the sanitizing of automatic door openers, right? And, and other ways to navigate space. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most exciting things for me over the last few months has been thinking about not only what the new challenges are, but as we move forward, what we can take away from this pandemic as far as what we've learned. And 
I think one of the things that, that is really powerful is new ways of engaging in academic work. A lot of students, for a number of reasons, related to those underlying health conditions, perhaps related to mental health, a number of different issues, chronic illness, are asking to engage in classes um, virtually. In the past, we would have said, you know what? I, I think that's really fundamentally altering what it means to be an RIT student or anywhere in higher ed. And we see now with a little bit of innovation, or I guess a lot of innovation, that it's possible. And doors, you're right, are being opened not only for the folks who need that access in a really acute way, but for all students um, who've, who've been pushing for different ways to engage. So I think we can't go backwards. Do you know what I mean? Even, even when, fingers crossed, this pandemic winds down, I'm hoping that it'll have broadened our understanding of what it means to engage actively in higher education, you know? Sure. And as you and I talked about, um, it's not limited just to RIT. When we think about uh, employers, and you know, one of the biggest barriers has been, well, transportation and things. Now that we've shown that remote working is possible and can be effectively done, that should reduce one of the barriers to employment that individuals with physical disabilities often face, you know, with public transportation not being accessible. So, okay. So I think, again, this is where RIT through our training programs, through being able to show these students have completed a co-op or internship remotely, they demonstrated the skill the employers now should be looking at that and saying, hey, you did a co-op with us remotely and you did outstanding and you were productive, you were effective. Hey, would you be willing to consider a permanent placement with us? So I'm excited. The, the, the last thing I wanted to say about this is that what we've learned, I think, also if we look at the number of individuals on campus that have asked for some kind of accommodations, not necessarily through your office, but just through their supervisor, we have a lot more individuals with disabilities than we realized. And so again, the inclusion of these individuals strengthens us as a community. It doesn't take from, it really strengthens us when we can think of creative ways to allow individuals with mental health illnesses or whatever to participate in the workforce through technology and through the support that's available through technology then it's a win-win both for RIT and for the individual. So I just see a lot of, six months ago, people would tell me, oh, that function, that job couldn't be done remotely. But we've proven that it can be done remotely in many situations. And so I just see this opening up all kinds of doors. The same thing for meetings like this. We normally would have had to drive 20 miles each, park our cars and do everything. Now we're doing it in a Zoom room. Is it working? Yeah, yeah. Does it require some adjustment on our part? Yeah, but there's a lot of exciting possibilities there. And RIT can be the really the center of innovative research looking for ways to help facilitate the employment success of individuals with debt who are disabled and deaf through the use of innovative technology. So, I'm excited about the years ahead and I'm looking forward to personally meeting you when we're on campus. I know. <laughs> Likewise, you know, we've had all these virtual interactions now, but I don't think we've ever physically been in the same space. And so, yeah, we will. That we will, we will. <laughs> you know, and I, I think, I, I love the tone of what you just said, this idea of, of possibility and sort of excitement about what's to come because, you know, from where I sit, one of the things that I, I hope to see change in the years to come is, is this sense of fear uh, or stigma or, you know, I'm not sure if we should talk about this. I'm not sure if it's appropriate when we, when we discuss disability and accessibility. And I, I see it in, in our students as well, you know, some fear in our initial conversations about how accommodation support can be possible here. You know, students will breathe a sigh of relief and say, you know, I'm so glad that we got these supports in place. I thought this was gonna be much more difficult, much scarier than it actually was. And so that's, that's the kind of culture change that I hope for is, is to see pride in disability identity, pride in accommodation use as a tool to create equity. And then, you know, in terms of thinking about what RIT can be in terms of taking a, a 
really global leadership role in terms of access and inclusion, I'd like eventually for those of us that coordinate accommodations to work ourselves out of a job. You know, if we continue to grow in the spirit of universal design, we won't need to apply these sort of retroactive solutions. And I think that's what we're starting to see is that the world becomes better. All of us become better when we are more inclusive. And as we start to sort of chip away at the barriers that exist, I mean, what a possibility that is.